if you lower IGF-1 and growth hormone signaling after, yeah, I think the data suggests about 50% of, of the effects. So this has been done with TOR, it's been done with growth hormone receptor. So yeah, you, you get a benefit, but you don't get this extraordinary effect mm -hmm. of growth hormone receptor mutation from birth. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today I sit down with Dr. Volta Longo to cover off on a few extra questions I had after last week's exchange. We talk about whether IGF-1 is the best biomarker to assess our risk of cancer, if resistance training negates the potential negative consequences of a moderate to high protein intake, and whether measuring your IGF-1 can be an objective tool for ascertaining if your protein intake is too high. As always, all references are included in the show notes, and if you want to watch this, you can do so on YouTube, where full-length videos of each episode of The Proof can be found. Please do enjoy. This is me and Volta Longo, PhD. Dr. Longo, thank you so much for, for coming back and, and joining me. I thought it would be a, a good idea to sort of tack this on to the end of our conversation, the, the sort of five questions or so that we've been throwing around on, on email. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So first question here, if someone is wanting to measure their risk of cancer in an objective way, I kind of walked away from our conversation and I thought – you know, some people might be thinking, well, with cardiovascular disease, I've been told, you know, keep an eye on your, your cholesterol and, and whatnot. But from a, a sort of cancer risk point of view, if someone was to walk in and speak with their doctor and order a blood test, is IGF-1, is that the best thing that we can measure that could is a bit of a window into our risk um, for, for cancer? Yeah, the best thing is, in fact, uh, by far is aging, right? So... Um, and now there's a, I mean, my foundation does the calculation for, it's very inexpensive, uh, but others can do it. And there's a method called BioAge, uh, Morgan Levine does that. Mm -hmm. And so you get your blood test. I think there's seven to 10 markers that are normally done by the doctor. And so for you, if you're chronologically, if your driver's license says 40 and your biological age is 30, that's by far your best protection. And, um, but then how do you get to, to lower biological age? Well, if your IGF-1 is very high, uh, you probably, let's say 250, 260, 300, but also, you know, 220, there's a lot of studies, including our own now associating that over 180, um, and we have shown that 120 to 160, 180, that's the ideal range. And so if you measure your IGF-1 and it's in that range, uh, mm -hmm. That probably is a good indicator that you're not overeating proteins or certainly you're not overeating the amino acids that, that control this insulin like mm -hmm. growth factor 1, IGF-1. Okay. And, and of course, the other risk factors are obesity right. and, uh, um, you know, high insulin, um, high diabetes. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so all of those, which of course represent mm -hmm. a lot of the a large portion of the population, they're all big risk factors for, for, for cancer. Um, and so, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so those are also uh, key. You know, it's key to, to get the, the abdominal fat down, the, the mm -hmm. liver fat down, um, and uh, the, uh, you know, glu fasting glucose, A1C, back in the ideal range. Those are, are very, very important. Mm -hmm. So just expand for a moment on that biological age test. So... Is that something that is is only done in one location? Um, you mentioned a group there, and they presumably so you're taking a range of different biomarkers. I think you said seven, and then somehow they go into a calculation that spits out a score. Like how how has that been developed? Yeah, yeah. So there's an algorithm that Morgan Levine at Yale had uh, put together. I mean, there's also, you know, the Orvert and other, you know, mm -hmm. epigenetic clocks, but those are much more expensive, much more involved. This, you can just go to any clinic in the world and say, I want to have these seven, eight markers, let's say, measured. 
then you send it to the, the Create Curious Foundation. Um, and then for, I don't know, I don't remember, so don't quote me on it, but like $10 or something okay. like that. And then uh, uh, they, they can calculate the, um, the biological age and there is a, you know, an mm-hmm. algorithm. Uh, so, so yeah, there is other ways to do it. So, I mean, the, the sure. shouldn't be feeling that, that but, but I, can, I don't know the other ways and I don't know if they're trustworthy. So I know that we do it correctly because we, we've been collaborating with Morgan for, for a long mm-hmm. time. Uh, and in fact, she was uh, part of my paper. She was right. the first author of my paper in 2014 mm-hmm. on proteins and IGF-1. So, so I trust, uh, of course, her and, and her method. And I think it's been validated. And uh, it's, it's one that we feel uh, confident. And then if we calculate it, then you're going to get the real biology. Right. Yeah, that's um, that's certainly become a very famous paper, that one. Um, so I'll, I'll put a link to that foundation into the show notes and, and people can read more, learn more about it if they they want to. But um, high-level IGF-1, you're saying, is one thing to look at. There are others looking at the visceral fat and HbA1c and all of these other markers of, of metabolic insulin. health and insulin and um, your body weight um, and smoking and alcohol and Abdominal all that Abdominal circumference, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so all of those sort of um, parts of metabolic syndrome. Um, okay, cool. Let's move on. So the second question that I had was related to the people in Ecuador with Laron syndrome um, who have that, that low IGF-1 genetically. And you have spoken many times and, and you mentioned earlier in our conversation that they live long lives, um, minimal uh, or low incidence of cancer, um, pretty long, um, healthy lives. I'm interested, how, how do we know that their longevity is due simply to low IGF-1? Do they have any other risk factors, these other things that we're talking about here that are also improved um, due to their genetics? We know, all right, not that it's IGF-1 because it's growth hormone receptor and that insulin, IGF-1, TOR, I mean, this is like a master regular, the growth hormone receptor. So it's not just about IGF-1, but certainly mm-hmm. IGF-1 is extremely low, as it is in the mice. And the mice that have growth, the same Laron mutation, they have uh, record longevity extension. And nobody's ever been able to get a mouse that is longer lived based on one mutation than this growth hormone receptor knockout, which is extremely low IGF-1. And this has been repeated by many laboratories, right? So in multiple genetic background, that's another important thing, right? So it can be done in different genetic background and it still works. And now we see it in the Laurons, in people. Uh, so that tells us it's not really about low, uh, low IGF-1. Very low IGF-1 is not a problem. But people that have a very low IGF-1 may have another problem, which causes the, the IGF-1 to, to become lower. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so, but if you're thinking about mechanism, it's clearly about reprogramming. So this growth hormone receptor is reprogramming individuals and mice into a, a maintenance mode, a low growth. And, and of course, then the idea is you do this when they're small and the mice are small, but you do this when you became, you get to normal um, height and and, and uh, size. Mm-hmm. So once you're normal height and size, then if you intervene, it seems to be still a good, very good uh, way to get you into a maintenance mode and get a lot of benefits. Maybe not all the benefits because some of them are growth. I mean, you have to have low IGF-1 when you're growing and maybe having reduced growth gives you like a lifelong mm-hmm. advantage. But then there's certainly, we think maybe 50% of this effects you can get later on, as we see with the diet, right? So if you switch at age 60, you still get most of the benefits of the diet switch and not, you know, it's not necessary that you switch at at age 20. Has there been any experiments looking at um, what happens in animal models later in life if you lower their IGF-1? Is it a similar um, sort of outcome as to what you saw, what you found in your paper in folks that were over the age of 65? Yeah, I think it's um, the, if you lower IGF-1 and growth hormone signaling after, yeah, I think the data suggests about 50% of, of the effects. So this has been done with TOR, it's been done with growth hormone receptor. So yeah, you, you get a benefit, but you don't get this just extraordinary effect mm-hmm. of growth hormone receptor mutation from birth, right? right? These mice are like exceptional. You know, half of them will get to 
So imagine, it's like saying, humans live to 80. Imagine now if humans on average will live to 115, and, and let's say 95% of humans develop some chronic disease. Now imagine that 95 goes down to less than 50. Mm-hmm. And so you get bought, right? Wow. That's, that's the extraordinary nature of these mutations. Um, so, yeah, so mm. you don't get uh, um, probably uh, all of it, mm-hmm. but you still get uh, maybe half of this. Right. So I was, I was kind of thinking about this from another angle, um, which is a slightly different question. But you know your paper with, with Morgan, which showed that um, lower uh, protein intake – in those adults that were under 65 was associated with less risk of cancer but then as it, as they as you looked at over 65 the relationship changed a bit um, and you didn't see a um, a higher risk of cancer right. with a sort of more moderate uh, or higher relative intake of protein has that ever been done in in animal models because i know that there's been protein restriction style models yeah, I think uh, this is done by Simpson in Australia. Uh, and um, uh, I, uh, yeah, he had a paper where he did something very similar and got similar effects, right? With mice, right. Uh, where the, the restriction later in life uh, was no longer beneficial. Mm. And, and I think he was also showing detrimental. So Stephen Simpson um, uh, it, did something very similar. I think we just we cited him also in our uh, recent paper okay. uh, talking about this these phases of life, right? So clearly, um, you know, you don't an eighty year old, and this is why if you look at mice and, and, and people, um, I mean, uh, mice after a certain age they start eating a lot more, right? And and it's probably because there's lack of uh, uh, sophistication or functionality, right? And, and so you need a lot more food to get the same. So now if you're already restricted to begin with, you start, and this is why humans even at, at age 65, 70, they start losing weight, right? So most people come to me and say, oh, I'm 72, I need to lose weight. And a lot of the times you want to say, no, you don't, right? Um, I mean, if they're just slightly overweight, you want to say, stay there. Because you're going to lose it anyways. And, and, mm-hmm. and by the time you get to 90, you might want to still have some fat left because you might have um, none of it left. So, so, so yeah. Okay. I think it's uh, the mice are also hurt by restriction. And we have shown also this in the Levine paper where we took mice, old mice, we severely restricted them. And then uh, uh, whereas if we did give 4% protein to a young mouse, after a month, nothing happened. If we give 4% protein to an old mouse, within 10 days, they lost a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that there was also evidence that you cannot have severe or even moderate uh, to low, let's say low protein intake in an older individual. Okay. All right, next question, number three. This is one that I've seen thrown around online as a bit of a a criticism or a knock on the idea that IGF-1 raises risk of cancer. I think it's easily explained, but I'd like to ask you it. So the 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 kind of the 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 claim or um, the phrase that people use is well, not everyone with high IGF-1 develops cancer. So how would you go about sort of unpacking that for someone? I have a, a very simple one. I think I put it in my book. You know, not everybody that drives 120 miles an hour gets in an accident. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. So it raises your risk, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah, it could raise your. I mean, if you if you have uh, multiple risk factors, and, and you're not taking care of your aging, right? So if you're aging more quickly by eating, let's say, Western diet, you know, one way we kill. Mm-hmm. Mice uh, uh, or mice die early if they have a Western diet, and then if they have a high protein Western diet with lots of fat, they even die die earlier. So yeah, so we know that the, the consequences in humans and in mice, um, and the more you're in, it's not just about IGF one, right? Obviously, but IGF one is in growth hormone receptor and the whole pathway, which includes also let's say leucine and other amino acids acting directly on the cells. So just pushing the system to reproduce and grow, reproduce and grow. And that's what you don't want, uh, is to, to have all this push for reproduce and grow, and also protect, as we have shown, and I think we discussed it before, with the human cells, right? So if we had high IGF-1, 
the human cells that were damaged, the epithelial cells, that kind of give rise to prostate cancer and breast cancer. So if we had lots of IGF-1, it protected, it increased the, um, the mutations, and then it decreased the death of the damaged cells. So this is a dual protective system. First, if you have low IGF-1, you get less DNA damage. Second, if you have low IGF-1, once you do get the DNA damage, you're more likely to die mm. as a precancerous cell, right? So that's a fact, right? And now, so yeah, so now right. you have lots of evidence from lots of different uh, mm. point of view, all pointing to the same direction. Then if you want to drive 120 miles an hour and say, oh, there's people that, that are perfectly fine with that, I mean, it's your call, but... Um, mm -hmm. Not a good call. Right. You mentioned to me on an email, which I thought was a, a good point, that um, you might have two people with the same IGF-1, but genetically one of those people are, are more sort of protected against cancer and the other's not as well. Absolutely, yeah. You could, you know, I, I was talking to uh, uh, Bruna, um, the, the scientist in, uh, uh, in southern Italy, and uh, um, she was talking about, people that have early Alzheimer disease mutation. They have 100% penetrance. What does that mean? It means that mm -hmm. if you have this mutation, it's called nicastrin, um, it, you have 100% chance of getting Alzheimer in your 40s. And then she said, there are some people that make it to 100, right? And because they probably have another mutation that completely blocks the, 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 the effect of the first one, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. so if you have an IGF-1, Lots of IGF-1, but then you happen to have a mutation, let's say in FOXO, that controls some of these transcription factors that have also been associated with longevity extension. Uh, you might be perfectly fine, right? But mm. yeah, you can't count on that. I mean, right. I mean, the only people that might be an exception if you have a family where everybody died past the age of 90 uh, and eating lots of proteins, right? So that, that family probably is protected. I wouldn't count on it, but uh, mm. there's certainly a, a good start. You know? Right. So your kind of, the logic here is we don't know where we kind of each individually land in terms of all of our genetics and, and risks. So we may as well assume that we're at risk and keep IGF-1 at a, uh, a sort of optimal level. Yeah, so getting to 100 is still fairly rare. Uh, so that means that, yeah, most people are not going to be born with... Uh, with uh, these benefits and so mm -hmm. keep your IGF-1 between 120 and 160, uh, 180 is probably fine and try to keep it mostly plant-based plus fish and uh, all the other things we talked about. Right. Yeah, the the other thing I like to remind people there because it's similar to someone saying, well, my, my grandmother smoked and drank and lived to 100 um, and it's possible but it's not probable. I think that's a, a good kind of um, way of... Oh, of I, I would make it much different. I would say it's very improbable. Okay. It's, uh, it's, so, so, I mean, we're not talking right. it's not probable. It's extremely improbable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the statistics are way against you, you know. And so, right. so as you're starting accumulating these, these uh, you know, oh, I don't care, I'm just going to still do well, you know, one, one, you know, okay, two, three, four, by the time you get to six or seven, it's almost like, a suicide, right? Mm -hmm. uh, together, you know, right. if you smoke, you have a bad diet, it's just almost guaranteed you're going to die early in life. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I could do everything good and I could still die early and I understand that. So I have a lot of pressure on, on living long, but, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. numbers, that's uh, probability. And, and uh, you know, and I also think it's important to say, you know, I, I did everything I could, you know. Right. And, you know, and this happened to me, I got hit by a truck and, uh, <laughs> And that's okay, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's really sad um, if somebody, you know, could have lived uh, longer, healthier, and enjoyed many, many years of life, and, mm -hmm. and doesn't do it. So, right, yes, very improbable. Within the data, the outliers exist, but the chances are slim, especially if you stack those risk factors on top of each other. Yeah, if you stack them, right? You know, if you have one, yeah, it's 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 uh, an, it has an effect, but. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. So, so having an IGF one of two hundred and ten, mm -hmm. you know, it might not have a huge impact. But now, you know, why do you have an IGF one of a hundred and two hundred and ten, um, and and uh, and who are you, right? So, uh, yeah, you could or 
be somebody affected by it, or you could be somebody completely mm-hmm. non-affected by it. Now, if you have an IGF-1 of 300, you're starting having mm-hmm. a much bigger problem. This is why acromegaly, you know, people that have, and I forget what the cutoff is, if it's 300 mm-hmm. or 350, but then they give them drugs, right? They have the approved drugs to treat it, right? So they, that's a clear condemnation to die very early mm-hmm. if you have acromegaly, and acromegaly is, mm-hmm. is a condition with, you know, very high IGF-1. So yeah, I'm saying that up to, after a certain point, it becomes a disease, like a formal, formally recognized disease. You mentioned pressure about longevity. It's an interesting thing to ponder, but I have often wond- wondered whether scientists like you, who for a living talk about longevity, others like David Sinclair, do you do you feel pressure personally? As to you do. <laughs> every time I have a headache, I'm like, oh, now I have to explain to everybody that I got mm-hmm. cancer. That, that you're <laughs> human, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah. So it's, um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, because everybody, you know, the, their rationality, I think, plays a, a big role. So if, if something happens to me, then they're like, they, they assume that, oh, everything I said, it must be wrong because look at what happened to me, right? Uh, but no, the, the numbers don't change, you know, so, so whatever happens to me is irrelevant. Um, like you pointed out, like just like the, you know, somebody that doesn't do any of the things and has all the bad behaviors. Sometimes they form bad behaviors and they make it to a very long life. Right? So, so, yeah, so things happen either way. You can be right. uh, doing everything perfect and still get a problem. And, and, you know, some cancers we know they're due to viral, in, you know, viral infections and uh and there might be nothing you can do, you know. Mm-hmm. Like pancreatic cancer, for example, doesn't really seem to have a lot of diet-based mm-hmm. uh, uh, risk factors associated with it. So, you know, why you get it, who knows, but uh, yeah, right. if you get it, yeah. there's nothing you could have done, you know. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that in, in t- the year 2070, we can, we can still be having these conversations together. You can um, have another <laughs> Um, question four. So I sent you a study by Gulick et al. It was looking at IGF-1 levels in three different conditions, um, post-exercise, post-protein ingestion, and then they had a combined um, post-exercise and protein. And uh, I believe this was a, a sort of crossover style thing. So each subject got a, a chance to do each of them and they were their own sort of comparison group. This study kind of interested me because I, I have always thought about whether amino acids and their effect on IGF-1, um, whether the sort of downstream effect that that could have on someone's risk of, say, cancer would be different if we we're looking at, say, someone who is sedentary versus someone who's doing a lot of resistance training and perhaps has a higher requirement for amino acids. And in that paper, they looked at 24-hour fasting IGF-1. Um, and interestingly, so the IGF-1 went up in the, the group that was uh, just post-protein. So all they did was protein um, went up by about 17% but it didn't increase in the group that did protein and exercise together. So I kind of wanted to, to get your thoughts on is amino acids and protein consumption, is the risk um, from that via IGF-1 in some way mediated by how much you move your body? Absolutely. Uh, but don't count on it, meaning that there's an experiment, right? What you just listed is an experiment. So then when you're talking about proteins, you have to think about, you know, in a year, what was your average amino acid uh, and what was your average IGF-1 in the year, right? So how many times you exercise? And so, yeah, the experiment is done a certain way and it's looking at a small window. Uh, You have to look at, you know, it's kind of like the, the idea of the A1C. So A1C is not just representing your, your fasting glucose. It's representing three months or, or so of your of your glucose levels, right? Yeah, so then uh, what is your average uh, IGF-1 when you have, let's say, you know, you eat 150 grams a, a day of proteins? Uh, what is your average amino acid level, right? So these amino acids, they give an opportunity to 
uh, independently by GFM, by the way, to push TOR and to push AKT and other growth signaling pathways. Um, so yeah, if you have lots of opportunities now, you know this one. One of the opportunities could be a precancer cell that is about to die, and all of a sudden it gets enough of this amino acid to activate BCL2. BCL2 prevents apoptosis. Next thing you know, you gain another mutation, and that's your death sentence, right? Uh, I don't want to make it very dramatic, but, uh, but 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 yeah. So you want to give this up? You want to reduce this opportunity on average all the time? Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't count on on uh, on that. I would just say I would turn around as we already discussed. You know, what is the lowest level of proteins that you can take to get the muscle that you need? You know, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, so that's that's a good way to go. Also, because protein have a lot to do with fat accumulation, and they seem to uh, promote, um, you know, fat uh, increase, right? So, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to say too much because we're about to publish on this, but 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 uh, uh, yeah, so there is a number of studies now suggesting that um, you know s s high protein could also benefit. Uh, storage of fat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I look forward to, to reading that. So you, you mentioned their average IGF-1. So when in your paper with Morgan and you were looking at the correlation between IGF-1 and um, cancer or mor and mortality, that was, was that IGF-1 that's, when we say average IGF-1, are we just talking about measuring a fasted IGF-1 or a, a fasting IGF-1 over a certain number of time points that you then average? How does that work? Yeah, no, you, you measure the fa fasted IGF-1. I mean, we didn't measure it. There was the NHANES, the CDC uh, study, right? So they measure it. Uh, I'm assuming it's a fasting IGF-1. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it matched very well the protein intake. So that those that had the high protein intake, those that reported having a high protein intake had over 200. Those that reported moderate protein intake had, uh, you know, let's say between 150 and 220. Mm -hmm. so. And then those that reported low had less than two, clearly, uh, you know, closer to 150. Now I forget it's in the paper, but yeah. So so yeah, the fasting IGF one uh, works well. It's not so for growth hormone because growth hormone is pulsatile, but the IGF one is pretty steady, mm -hmm. and um, and so it's um, those are those are good measurements, and this is why it matches well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings me to question five, which is sort of building on a, an earlier question from earlier in our conversation that I asked and comes back to the way that I eat. And I'm, I'm not sort of asking this for selfish reasons. I believe that it's probably quite common. There's probably a lot of listeners to the show that are that are eating similar to myself or have similar goals. Um, and so maybe are, are thinking the same thing. So with that in mind, so if my diet is moderate protein and that's all from plants, um, but not low protein, so more of a moderate, it's, it's by no means what it, would be considered sort of high, kind of sits in the middle. And um, I guess people have different definitions of that. But let's say that it's moderate protein from plants and I get my IGF-1 tested and it falls between say 120 to 160 nanograms per mil, which is what I got from your 2020 meta-analysis with um, Jamal Romani, I think that was the, the first author, right? Um, mm -hmm. so can I, can I take it in that scenario that if I, if I, if I test the IGF one, it's between 120 to 160, can I sort of take it that due to my overall lifestyle and perhaps resistance training that I can get away with that protein intake? Um, would that be a kind of objective way for me to, to determine that? Possibly, uh, and the reason is that because you're vegan or mostly vegan, the content, so IGF-1 is not really about protein, right? If you think about it, interesting, it's not really about protein, it's about amino acids, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so methionine, in, in, so let's say that your diet is highly in legumes or mostly legumes, methionine and leucine are very low, very low. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, a third or a fourth sometimes than compared to a steak per gram of protein, right? So, so yeah, then, uh, then uh, um, you know, this is why I suggest a pescatarian diet and uh, a, a vegan diet because, um, 
a lot of people, if they're just vegan, they're going to be not protein deficient. They're going to be amino acid deficient. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the sort of the, 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 the vegans that follow everything, then they get seeds, they get nuts, you know, and then they're fine because the seeds and the nuts have high methionine, high leucine, you know, different foods. You'll have to check into it because, you know, this is just a statement in general. Right. A, there are exceptions. Let's say legumes in general. Uh, have very little of certain amino acids that are key to drive IGF-1, to drive growth. Yeah, so then if you're having a, a high legume diet and uh, your IGF-1, uh, even though you may have you know, more proteins that, that, that I preach, uh, you're probably fine because uh, at the end you're getting the right amount of amino acids. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean, I eat with great diversity, so I know that I'm getting all of the different amino acids um, across the day. But I do think if you looked at the branch chain amino acids in my diet, they still would come in lower than yeah. a diet that had a lot of animal food. So um, that's interesting. I'm going to get IGF-1 tested and I will uh, I'll report back. Um, thanks, Volta. That's, that's all the questions I had. So uh, I appreciate yeah, you coming back on and um, helping me sort of tie off on some of these loose ends. Uh, enjoy the rest of uh, your day, my friend, and I look forward to connecting again sometime in the near future. Yeah. See ya. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.